Hello and welcome to my house and Happy New Year to you all from me and him. Now, I'm kicking things off in 2022, just as I mean to go on by treating you to some more delicious food, more incredible recipes from the country's best chefs, a more fascinating chat with other top guests. So what are we doing out here then, Ralph? Let's get inside and let's get cooking. Are you coming in then? Good morning, and before we start, Happy New Year, everybody! <laughs> and what a show we got lined up for you today. Right, I'll be joined throughout the morning by actress, podcaster, and food writer Faye Ripley will be here. Yay! And I'll be taking the tips to the Isle of Scilly on one of my favourite food adventures. The one and only Richard Corrigan will be here as well. Yay! Legend, Mr Corrigan, with a fantastic recipe. And if your cupboards are still full from Christmas, then I'll be showing you how to turn them into the ultimate leftover croc monsieur in this week's little mask class. But my first guest in the kitchen is a genius chef from the award-winning Inner Sea. I think he's one of the best chefs cooking in Britain, and I think you lot agree as well, because the cue from his restaurant is ridiculous. It's brilliant, Gareth Ward! Yay! Thank you very much. Welcome to the show, Chefy. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Christmas was good? Yeah, brilliant, thank you. Christmas was very good? Yeah, busy, busy. What are you going to be cooking for us today? I'm going to do your um, a beautiful little raw shrimp green curry today. Right. We get these unbelievable uh, local shrimps twice a year. Right. And we put them in our minus 80 freezer and uh, of course you do. eat them, obviously, as you do. Yeah. Uh, and they're just the most incredible, sweet, fatty, insane textured prawns uh, when we just serve with a really simple green is curry. Is this, this, you say it's really simple green curry. Is that the chicken one that I had last time I was in your restaurant? It, yeah, that's the one, yeah. We do it Which is the well. best yeah. Thai green curry I've ever tasted. Well, you're going to have it today, mate, so that's good. That's what I'm hoping. <laughs> you need to try this. You need to try it as well. Right, our first dish today is a recipe for onion squash soup that I'm going to use uh, some Cornish veg from a producer. I'm going to introduce you very shortly. But first thing, uh, the onion squashes. Obviously, they've got such an array of amazing veg that we've got in here. Uh, banging season. I love onion squash. I don't know about what you think. But, onion squash, yeah. It's I mean, amazing. I know you're a great lover of produce and season as well, but, but onion squash like this... This, the, the colour of this it's is amazing. Just look at the colour of that, it's fantastic. So these are your little onion squashes. What you can do, the great thing about this, you can eat the entire lot of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our onion squash like that, take out our centre, including the seeds, this bit. And it's, I find it easy, you can use a spoon, but I find it much easier if you use one of these. Yeah. These little, um, Good little melon baller. So what you want to do with this is you want to start off by scooping out this and you can see how easy it is with something like this because you can get right in and scoop out the majority it's a lot easier than a spoon that, eh? i think it's a lot easier than the spoon because it's a lot sharper you see yeah. so and then what you want to do is then hollow, start hollowing this out look what's a scary face are you going for sorry you're going to put a scary face i'm not it? doing a scary face no, this no. is just going to get rusty in the oven chief that's all it is <laughs> just going to there we go we're just going to we did houses remember that exactly <laughs> exactly so once we've done that stage then we can just cook this and all i'm going to do to cook it is you've got a little bit of this stuff as well is i'm going to cook it in just milk oh. so i'm not going to cook it in anything other than just milk because I just want the flavour of the veg to come through. And I think if you start putting onions and garlic and all that kind of thing, you're yeah, taking man. out the flavour of what the soup keep, is. Keep so, it simple, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And the same thing applies if you're doing a carrot soup, just cook it in milk. Mm. Don't, but don't put the, any onions or garlic in. But why, why would I tell you about veg when we can go, hopefully, by the power of the internet, uh, to the wilds of Bodmin uh, for our first trip to a supplier in the new year to speak to Amelia Lake from the Real Food Garden. She's there in a garden, looking amazing. Amelia, good to see you. Good to see you. There you are. Now, now, I've got Gareth with me as well, a big fan of your produce as well. You've got a selection of produce that you kindly sent me as well. How did you first yeah. of all get into all this? Because it, it's an amazing project that you're doing, but how did you, how did you get into it first of all? It's quite a fight, actually. I think, you know, there's not many young um, female um, sort of sort of well-educated people out there who are really encouraged to go into food production. It's just not really a realm that is easily accessible for a lot of people. But after a long time and a lot of trying other things, I just thought, you know what, this is what I really want to do. 
and we came and we started the real food garden. That was five years ago. We've doubled the size now. Uh, we've got our own on-site farm shop. So we've really just grown what we're doing here. I know as well as Gareth knows, when you're producing your own veg, it never stops, does it yeah. really? It's, it is quite relentless. No. It absolutely is. And for us, we're producing veg throughout the year. So our veg boxes run roughly from about June till the end of January. But in between that time, we're getting ready for the following season. You know, the garlic are already up, raising out of the ground at this time. It might be really cold and bleak, but we've already started sowing the peppers and the aubergines for next year. So, so tell us what's in season at the moment then, because you've sent me an amazing selection that we've got in here. What can people look forward to in your place? What's, what's in season right now? Still, you've kind of got the lovely veg, like your really flavoursome roots, the, the parsnips and the celeriacs, those kind of veggies that actually kind of tend to improve with a bit of cold weather. And with the frosts, we don't have so much down here. So we have to wait that little bit longer for the frost. So I'd say that they're really great. We've also got... Um, We've got the leeks as well. Leeks are just absolutely fantastic at the moment. But I'd say also throughout the year, um, greens, like winter is perfect for your brassica greens. And there's obviously a traditional curly kale. So now you've got, you've got a particular ethos on the farm as well. You don't, you don't spray. Um, I mean, no. and because of that, I mean, the Taurus, it's, it's, it's a lot, it's labour intensive anyway. I've got a veg plot at the yeah. bottom of the garden. I know how, how tricky it is. I mean, you've got quite a, quite a large plot that you've got there. This is all going to be done yeah. by hand. So we grow over two acres, and because we're, we're no dig, that's one of the. It's labour intensive, but it's one of the reasons that we're able to have such amazing kind of credentials in terms of um, being sort of carbon. Uh, positive or carbon negative, the way you want to look at it, and we can absorb more carbon into our soils than the whole rest of our business puts out. And that's because we don't cultivate our soils. We add lots of organic matter on top, um, sort of continuously nurturing them. We don't use herbicides, fungicides, pesticides, or artificial fertilizers. We focus instead on really holistically looking at the way we manage the site. Our mission, our vision for the real food is to nourish people in place. And that really means nourishing the soil, also trying to increase biodiversity. And that's been something that we've focused on since the beginning. Um, and it, it does pay off with really good quality produce. But it also means that we live in a place and we create this place that is absolutely thriving from the bottom up. It's going back, isn't it? It's going backwards, but make things better. Well, it's actually, it's a, you know, it's like everything else. When you, I think chefs are notorious for that. You push the boundaries further and further and further. And then at some point, you have to then think... Yeah, rein it well, in. You're, you're reining it yeah, in. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember coming to your place for the first time. You've got these birch trees and you, yeah. you were tapping the birch Yeah. Side. In another five years' time, we'll be able to tap them. I can't wait. We've got the orchard. It's like 30 trees. But you're thinking about yeah, five yeah. years down the line yeah. as well. But... But that's just a normal thing to do. I mean, there's been a lot said as well about farming and everything else. And I, I know you're, you're, you're obviously, you've got the same ethos as well. Uh, when you drive along the, side, the, the, the road, particularly in Cornwall, 20 years ago, there used to be bugs on your windscreen. Yeah. Nowadays, sadly, that's disappeared. And it's all to do with the intensive farming, I'm assuming, the lack of habitat for, for insects along, along uh, hedgerows, which is so essential when you're producing anything, veg, it's Whether you're in well, Kent producing like apples and things like that, it's so essential. I think with the um, with the industrialisation of agriculture, you know, farmers have been squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. They're being required to produce high volumes of really cheap commodities. Um, and what we're trying to do here is produce really good quality at a fair, affordable price without having to sacrifice any of those other elements like soil quality, like landscapes, and like biodiversity, and it's, I guess it's regenerative agriculture, and we're looking to try and do something new in a different way that puts back to the place that we're in. Well, I'm just going to take this amazing squash that you've sent me as well, and I'm just going to blend it all up. So this has just been cooked in in real time. This has just gone in there with a little bit of milk. My um, my veg has been frying away nicely. I've got my parsnips. I've got my celeriac bits and pieces. Take the lid off this. Just start this up. Start this blending as well, first of all. But what I want to do is show you the leek. Now, when you get leeks like this from Amelia, you've got a little bit of stuff in it there. 
bit of Cornish soil, <laughs> that kind of stuff. The best the way to do this, and the, good, well, the best way to do this as well, because you never really get to show people how to do this, the best way to wash a leek is to slice it all the way through, top to bottom, and then rinse it under the tap to the root pointing upwards. That way, when the, you rinse it, the soil rinses out the bottom. If you do it the other way, it pushes the soil inside the leek. So you rinse it down the way, like that. It's so good to see you show that, James, because we're always trying to speak to our customers about the best way to cook with a veg which hasn't been sort of mechanically tumbled and cleaned and bagged up. So <laughs> thank you for doing the good work of that. Well, also, uh, the simplicity of how you cook it, I think, Amelia, that's the important bit, is that all I've done is fry this off with, with a little bit of butter, some salt and pepper, you don't need anything else. Well, it's do you? good. You don't have to do anything to it, do you? It's a bit like the soup. Soup. You don't need to do anything else. Just a bit of seasoning. It's the common mistake that people do. You think Definitely. seasoning? Definitely. They don't season it enough. Don't season it enough, and then it's just not good, is it? So, a bit of salt, a bit of pepper, and because Amelia, you can't taste this, but because Gareth's this superstar chef, I've got to make sure that yeah. I've seasoned this properly. Otherwise, he'll he'll, he'll tell me straight away. <laughs> that needs more salt. More salt in there, and it then what we're like, going to do? It looks so like velvet. That is <coughs> amazing. It's nice, no? And then we can take our little pot, which we've got in here, and then I've got your wonderful veg. Now I don't know whether you guys can see this, but the colour of this veg in here. Yeah. And I That's love. That's the thing, you know. The meals to be beautiful. You, you know, veg stand out on the plate just as any other ingredient, and it's yeah. you know texture clear, and the you know. The cut, you know, it's a bit like the Kioja beetroot that I've got here. It's, you know, it should be vibrancy in the of middle that. of. <laughs> so what? It, so just so just so we know, when when did you plant that then? So because I quite fancy planting beetroot next year. What if, what do you call that? Yeah. What is that? So I was taught how to pronounce it by an Italian lady. She said Kioja. Right. So I think it's often uh, pronounced Chiogia. Yeah. Um, but we've also got the Detroit, the, the regular red beet. And we'll sow a succession throughout the year so that we have got a continued supply. So we'll start in March, but we'll carry on sowing all the way into August, into August so that we can kind of go all the way through the year. And we're just starting the new year. I'm just going to finish up this off with the, the cheese over the top. We're just going to take, take a bit of this and then just allow Brilliant. this to melt under the grill. Ooh, now, obviously, we're stop. starting things off in the new year. It, for you, it never stops. If anybody's got an allotment <laughs> out there, um, that wants to get back out into the garden, it never stops. What would they be doing now? What can you put in the ground right now that's ready for the summer? What would you be doing now? So focusing now on some spring veg, things like your, your spring onions um, and things like kohlrabi if you'd like to do them. Um, but I'd kohlrabi. also be thinking kind of your, your greenhouse or polytunnel veg, so tomatoes, um, aubergines, sweet peppers, heritage to variety. If you've got a bit of heat, you've got a nice windowsill there, you can start them off and those plants will get to a good size by the time you're ready to plant them later on in spring. So you can start with a nice early crop of say tomatoes, but they'll also go all the way through to October. We can have a nice long season of tomatoes in the UK still. Well, you're not, you're not popping past uh, Winchester and Hampshire by any ch chance in, in the coming months, are you? <laughs> I'll pop by. I'd love to come and see your place. I, I, I'm going to say, bring a spade as well. You can get me out in the garden. It's what you're doing there is amazing. So thank you very much, guys. It's lovely to speak to you. Thanks, thank James. You, so this one's about another 10 seconds. You can see though the parsnips. Look at these. They're amazing. Yeah. And and they use smell the smell so good. But use the skins as yeah, well. Yeah, everything. Use the lot. Always try not to just give them a wash in it and leave the skins on. Yeah. So much flavour in skins. Uh, I think it? I think so as well. Same thing with carrots yeah. as well. You know all that kind yeah. of stuff. But but look, we just take our. That smells amazing, that does. I'll tell you what, that looks all right, doesn't it? Looks all right, that chef. Happy with that Doing one? a good job there, mate. Thank you very much, Chief. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got your nice little... Look. Oh, yeah. Watch them fingers. The cheese is hot. But the cheese is nice and warm. The idea is you put the little lid on the side. Oh, yeah. Just need massive loaf of bread now. Yeah, I do, and the great thing about this is you can eat the entire lot. Yeah. So again, you were talking about Just the skins. Make a sandwich out of it. Well, make a sandwich out. Of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you again, you're on about the skins. Wait, you see the crop mature later. But <clears throat> again, you're on about the skins. 
you can eat the entire lot. The seeds you can use, that's the great thing. Good quality veg, just use the whole lot. And they taste amazing. Look at that. And, you know, <laughs> that with a little bit of the, the cheese on the top, you can mix and match the cheese if you didn't want to do that. A little bit of Stilton possibly over the top. That with the croque monsieur on the side. That's, well, that's, 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 that's coming later on. So that's we're topping the tail in it, Chef, <laughs> with a light lunch. Anyway, there you have it. Um, little insight of where you get your brilliant veg from. Easy as that. There you go. Cheers, Chef. Unbelievable. Yeah. And then, what you do, do, you should just take that, you see. Look, yeah. the whole thing just opens up, look. Look at that. Oh, well, I'm going on Cheese. my Cheese. Oh. Then you've got the veg inside. This is, this is what you want, isn't it, this time of year? Well, mate. It's unbelievable, that is. It's not bad in 10 minutes. You can, you can already cook, can't you? <laughs> no, it's all right in 10 minutes, though. all right, yeah. Well, you know, bit of practice. We're into year <laughs> 29. I reckon you might nail it one day, you know. Yeah, I'll do all right one day. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely, though, that, isn't it? Yeah, it's absolutely Nice delicious. and simple, with a grilled cheese on top. Mm. So be right, still come. We've got dishes from this fella, Gareth, and Chef Richard Corrigan. Mm. And I'll be joined in the house by Cold Feet star Faye Ripley very shortly, but mm. don't go anywhere, because after the break, we'll be trying to answer some of your culinary questions. I'll see you in a minute. Welcome back. Now, I'll be giving you a masterclass in Christmas leftovers a little bit later, and I'll be chatting and cooking for my guest, Faye Ripley. But first, I'm back in the kitchen with Chef Gareth Ward, and we're going to hopefully try and answer some of your cooking questions. We should be so, able to sort this yeah, out. We should, we we should, should be, be able to sort yeah. Well, you may be. Yeah. Uh, we should be joined on the line by Vivian Dickinson. Good morning to you, Vivian. I can hear James. How are you doing? How's Sunderland, all right? Sunderland's very sunny, thank you very much. It's lovely. Fantastic. Now, how can I help you? What's your question? Well, James, what I'd like you to help me with this morning is overcoming my fear of aubergines. I feel that they always come with a risk warning. Every chef says, oh, goodness, they, they absorb so much oil. I think it's the, 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 the skin, which looks lovely, but is quite tough, and then you've got a very spongy inside. And then, finally, the aubergine always seems to be centre stage of any recipe. So... If the, the uh, recipe is a disaster, so will the, the meal will be a disaster, and that'll be very sad for all. Concerned. Aubergine. What do you... So I would like you to help me overcome my fear of aubergine. Well, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to show you two dishes, all right? So I'm sure Gareth is going to chip in as well. So we're going to do two dishes. First of all, I'm going to do one of my favourite. Yeah. Aubergine parmesan, yeah. which is one of my favourite, favourite things at all. It's very so... true what she says there. They are very... They do absorb a lot of oil, but then you just use a great oil to cook them with. Yeah. And this, then the, the key to it now is aubergines have become hybrid. Yeah. So aubergines back in the day... In the day when I first started cooking, before you started yeah, cooking. Just a bit. Back in the day, I know, <laughs> tell me about it. You used to have to salt and put aubergines in milk because they were quite bitter. Yeah. You don't really need to do that anymore. They've had a lot of the bitterness spread out of them. But I, like, still, I still do it, though. But like Gareth was saying, it's all to do with the quality of the oil yeah. you use. If you use well. a rubbish oil, then you're going to get something rubbish, aren't you? Yeah. So it's the quality of oil. And this, this is the same whether you do, whatever you're doing with it, really. So I'm going to use quality oil for the sauce. This is quality extra virgin olive oil. Yeah. This this pan over here, we're going to take our aubergines and start pan frying them. And you use it like as, that sponginess and that abs it's going to absorb all of that flavour. So you use something very tasty. So then the, the end result is incredible. Precisely. So we're going to, going to take our little bit of oil over here. This is a nice little. I mean, this is a simple classic sort of sauce that you do with a tomato, so a tomato-based sauce. So garlic, just take. Whack, whack some garlic, that's going to go into our pan. I absolutely love aubergines. I think aubergines are fantastic. People say that, like, people are very scared of them, but I think there are, there's so much you can do with them. I think they're fantastic. Like so the baba ganoush, absolutely incredible. Yeah. You but, know. But nice little sauce. You've got garlic, you've got basil. Hopefully you can see that, Vivian. Then you've got tinned tomatoes. That's going to go in here. We're going to make a really quick and simple little sauce to go with our aubergines. Our aubergines are cooked nice and quickly. Take that over. And you can see it will absorb this oil, but as long as it's really good oil, yeah, keep on like Gareth was saying, it doesn't really matter, does it? No, does it doesn't, no. So, 
And again, plenty of oil in the sauce over there. So the way we one. cook them at the restaurant is we slash them, salt them. We still salt ours. Yeah. And then we cook them at two different temperatures in really good oil. So we cook them at a low temperature first, and they kind of absorb the oil and yeah. go really soft. Well, and it's interesting we... that you say that, because you can take the aubergines like these. Hopefully you can see these, Vivian. So these are the small aubergines. Yeah. These are like the Thai ones, aren't they? Yeah. So these are the small ones. These, with the aubergines itself, if you take these and deep fat fry them... Yeah, they're amazing. These are amazing. So you're just going to take the aubergines like this and then bring them across to our fryer and deep fry them. But yeah. keep and if you your do that at a lower temperature first, yeah. they go soft, take them out and then turn the temperature right up and then chuck them back in, they go crispy, crispy. and mushy so on the inside. They're exactly. absolutely insane. But these are going to go straight in the deep fat fryer, yeah. all right? This aubergine over here, what we're going to do is going to take our parmesan and mozzarella. So you take fresh parmesan, like that, a little bit of parmesan cheese, and then mozzarella. You see the sauce cooking away nicely. That's tinned tomatoes, garlic and basil. You can put a little bit of chilli in there if you wanted to. And then we take mozzarella cheese. Oh, yeah. Really good mozzarella. Place that over the top. So it's mozzarella and parmesan. A bit more parmesan over the top. There we go. Hopefully you can see that. And then pop these under the grill. So nice hot grill. These are going to go in there. That one out. Once about sort of two minutes under the grill. These are frying away nicely. Now the sauce with this. This is right at Gareth Street, but he'll be doing a little bit more longer cook for this one. Uh -huh. The sauce for this is, is an amazing sauce. This comes from a little bit of mirin, some sugar, and then white mizu paste. Hello, you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but white mizu, mizu and, and aubergines... It's incredible. I just think it tastes amazing. <laughs> but it's amazing, this sweetness with the aubergines as well. Yeah, definitely. So this it amount of sugar. So well. And you whisk all this lot together. Now, you can get this, uh, this miso paste from the supermarket, and you want to whisk this together with a bit of sugar and a bit of the mirin, and you're just making this very, very quick and simple sauce, like that, as it all starts to come together. It's a really unusual thing, this, um, but the taste of it is, is, is really, really different and tastes amazing. So the aubergines, look. And the special part about that is you can buy lots of different uh, different types of miso, so you can get lots of different flavours. I think if you venture into yeah, your yeah. supermarkets, I was walking around, there's two different types. Yeah. Where you get your miso paste from, the online and get, stuff like that, you can yeah. get... We're actually starting to look into making our own now. Because right. we've got, we've made our own koji, so the next step is to make your own misos and garams and all that kind of stuff, like your own soys almost. So, <clears throat> this is a step further than where I want to go for this, this <laughs> recipe, So. You take a little bit of that, get yourself some salt over the top, okay. and then you can grab your aubergines. We can then lift this across. I just think it looks great just as it is, like that. Yeah. But you've got your nice little bit of aubergines just pan-fried like that. And then the sauce. You can get your nice little sauce. And this is the simple sauce that you go over the top. Beautiful. So you take a bit of that. And then finally, hopefully, yep, yeah, doing all right. Then we can take some sesame. So I've got two different types of sesame. We've got the white and the dark sesame over the top. And there you have one dish with your aubergines, with a little miso caramel. The other one, Hopefully I like that one, Vivian. But then hopefully this one, we've got our tomato-based sauce. So again, salt and pepper. You can change this, you can add a little bit of chilli to this if you wanted. But you've got your lovely sauce with the garlic, the basil. I love the garlic. Imagine just... that with wilted wild garlic in the spring. Yeah, I mean, it's just lovely. Yeah, a little bit of this. But like you say, it's all to do with the quality of the oil, don't you think? Yeah, definitely. You are going to cook with it yeah, and use it, a decent quality oil. You've got to use incredible oil for things like this. If it's going to be a part of the dish, isn't it? It's not just cooking, it's... Yeah. You add enough of it to spit that sauce out and 
the bitterness of that beautiful olive oil. You want to split the sauce, that's yeah, the key to it. Yeah. And then you can grab your aubergines. You can lift these out. And these can just go over the top. Look at that, man. So there we go, Vivian. You've got your parmesan, your mozzarella cheese, over the top. Two dishes, all out of aubergines. Happy with that? Do you know I could eat that? You can do that. Absolutely <laughs> lovely. Can I just ask, when, when you say uh, best quality uh, extra virgin oil, do you mean the best you, that one can afford yeah. when you go on the supermarket? Now, this is, this is a tricky one. I, I, use, I use a Greek olive oil. Yeah. So, Greek or Crete olive oil. So, a lot of people go for Italian olive oils. No. Fine. No, straight away, you yeah, see? Yeah, it's not the best. Uh, no, yeah. Do you think? Yeah. Uh, I might, I'm going to upset the Italians watching this, but yeah. I genuinely, genuinely think that I think Greek yeah. or Crete olive oil is just incredible. The flavour is incredible. I completely agree with you. Yeah. yeah. Completely agree with you. I was in the supermarket yesterday as well and I found it. You can get it in, it usually comes in tins rather than bottles, but you'll see. Make yeah. sure, you, but olive oil is very, it, it's different from country to country, but that's the one I would pick. Yeah. Try and, it with that. And it's just like, obviously, it is expensive olive oil because it is what it is. But it's a special thing, and you don't have it on everything. You use it for certain dishes, you use it as a special ingredient. So, you, yeah, you treat yourself when you have something like this made with an incredible olive oil. But you keep that olive oil just for these things, and it's what it makes it worth buying, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, rather than use it for everything, yeah. you just use it for a little special treats. But exactly. there you have it. Two dishes in, in very, very quickly, all using aubergines. Thank you. That's a pleasure. Best of luck with that. I love doing those. Uh, good fun, aren't they? Yeah, amazing. There you go. If you've got any questions for anything to do with food, then do drop us a line to one of the addresses on the screens right now, and I'll try to answer them on the future shows. Still to come, I'll be making an epic croque monsieur in this little mask class, and Gareth and Richard will be sharing their kitchen skills a little bit later. But don't worry anyway, because after the break, I'll be chatting to coffee staff, Faye Ripley. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, me and Galton Blackiston will be exploring the Isles of Scilly on the latest leg of my food adventures. And I've got a master class in croc monsieur coming your way. But first, I'm here with Ralph, uh, and also a food writer, presenter, podcaster, an actor who shot to fame in the brilliant core feats. The brilliant Faye Ripley is here. Yeah. Yeah. Happy New Year, Happy New Year. There you happy go. Happy New Year. Uh, happy New Year. How are you, anyway? Pretty good. good. I mean, you know. Well, it's going to be a good, for, good year for you, anyway. I think it's going to be busy. I think it's looking like it's going to be busy. So I thought I'd, I thought I'd do some cooking for you. Now, you should be here doing this, really, because uh, you've done, <laughs> what, three cookbooks now, have you? I've done three cookbooks. You don't think that, though. I, 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 it doesn't bother me. Really? No, it doesn't bother me slightest. OK, great. The more people cook, the better it is. I agree. And the more people can cook on a Saturday, the more chance of I having a, getting a day off. You see, that's, <laughs> that's what I'm looking for as well. So uh, it doesn't bother me in the slightest. So Good. I thought with this, um, I thought I'd do some lamb chops. But uh, we get a little brief about our guests. And, and, and it's not really a little brief with Faye. It's quite a long brief with Faye. It's not a, it's not a, sort of a, a, a dislikes and likes sort of thing like that. But you've just bought yourself a pizza oven. I've got a pizza oven. You have got a pizza it's oven. It's not as big as yours, <laughs> thicker. <laughs> but you have got a pizza oven. Yes, I do. And, and successful in your pizza oven or not? Well, listen, I'm making amazing pizzas. Right. But I'm only doing what it says on the tin. I'm only making pizzas. What I, I, the thing I'm scared of is putting anything else in there. Well, here we go. Look, look. Uh, what about yeah. what about roast lamb chops? They look very thick. They look like they're going to take forever. And you, in that know. oven, less than five minutes. Five minutes. Because, as you know, with your pizza oven, it's all to do with the temperature of the stone that you get. You'll never get pizzas good if you don't get the stone, the base of it, hot enough. So yes. that's the key with that. It actually should be burning my back, which it is doing now. <laughs> um, and then we're going to take some olive oil. So salt and pepper, olive oil, over the top like that. And then we're just going to pop the lamb chops straight in. And like I was saying, not more than about sort of five minutes. At really? the same time, we can take roasted veg. Is amazing mm. in the pizza. Mm. Listen to that, they're already cooking. Something's happening. Yeah. That's already cooking already. That's amazing. Listen. Can I show you how to do that? What's that? As an actor, you can make that like well, a you click your fingers and that's a, like a mimey thing. Is it? That sounds the same, yeah. It sounds the same as that. These are getting well, really hot, really. actually. I'm gonna put these on the side, though. But you see, look, they're cooking away nicely, look. 
Straight yeah, they away. really are. I mean, they're so, so quick in a pizza oven like that. Mm. Same thing with broccoli. Broccoli's amazing. Vegetables, when you roast them in the oven. Broccoli or even onions, just onions with uh, cut with the skins on. Mm. Just uh, olive oil over the top. But broccoli is unbelievable, particularly this. This is your sort of... Uh, it's Sprite good to broccoli. change it up with broccoli because it can you can get a little bit in a in a rut with the broccoli, can't you? Well, also you can become the same thing with pizzas. Pizzas, pizzas, and more pizzas, and more pizzas, and more pizzas in a pizza True. oven. True. But tr just change it slightly and do your veg. So, how did you get from from doing what you're doing to then your first cookbook? How did that start? How did how was well, that? How did that happen? Look, I I I, I was cooking for my family and I was. I, I basically felt that what I needed wasn't out there. Even though you've written 5,000 cookbooks, at that time, yeah. you hadn't written the one I wanted for what my family. What was the one that you wanted? Easy, accessible ingredients. Uh, that, and the key thing for me with my cooking is I have to have a round of applause, so it has to achieve a round of applause. Otherwise, it's not worth doing. Is that, is that every day in your house? Correct. Every time you cook, yeah. you just get a round it's of applause. It's really stressful for my husband and my kids. You see, it's, see, it's stressful with this crew, because I've been asking this every Saturday and I don't get it. After about <laughs> the sort of fourth dish you do in the morning, they go, oh, he's uh, doing it again, he's just doing it again. I, I just think that food should be celebrated and I think I should be celebrated when I produce something delicious, as you should and Do you will. get that from your travels as well or not? Because, you, I mean, you've done so much in your career as well. And, and travelling around. Do you, get, do, you, do you cherry pick that with your recipes and stuff like that, or is it stuff that concentrate on the home cooking side of it? It's, uh, well, in terms of the stuff that I cook and enjoy cooking and yeah. pass on, I I'll take it from anywhere I can. I'll probably nick this recipe to be fair. This is on book. page 24 of the next <laughs> one. <yeah>. Probably. <laughs> um, but I was brought up by um, a whole, I had an elaborate sort of family system of. Um, an Italian stepdad and my German stepmom, and so I had a lot of influences from a lot of places. You're an amazing child growing up, so it was it was definitely varied. Let's put it that way. It was varied, but that then led you to to do more and all manner of different things later on in life. Because uh, I've got to mention Call Feet. What I mean, when you first of all got that telephone call, you kind of envisaged that that it had been and gone on to be the successful that it's gone on to. Didn't you? Well, we did. We had no idea. I mean, actually, None it failed. Of you didn't really, it failed. It, it, it went out on telly, and no one watched it, and that was the end of that. But then it just. They re they re showed it when it won uh, a big award, big comedy award, and um, uh, the Silver Rose, and yeah, and then it sort of just grew. But we never knew, we never really. Every year, look at that. It's brilliant, isn't it? Like that's just a little miracle, there, isn't it? it I just think broccoli cooked cooked in a in, in the wood fired oven. To me, it doesn't get any better than this, just I as think, it is. I think people are scared that it's going to be too hard. You want broccoli to have a bite. You want it to have a bite. And you yeah. can cook it longer in there, which is fine. But look at, look at the lamb chops. I'll bring these across, but... <gasps> look at these. Don't show Ralph. I know, he's, yeah. already, he's already clocked that already, but pop this Delicious. over the top. Like I said, you can, I mean, you kind of imagined it, Ooh. because it, it did not fail, but it did... Wasn't wasn't yeah. that popular to start off with? No, we we honestly we didn't know, and and honestly every single year we thought that was going to be the last year, and uh, I think we did. In the end, I think there were sort of sixty episodes, something like that. I wasn't in all of them because I left. But anyway, then I came back and it was all good. So you're venturing into a lot of things now. Tell us about this this podcast thing because this is ah. this is this is a new venture for you. So this is tell us tell us about the podcast thing and where did this idea come from? Because so, a lot of people are doing it, but this is a very this is a very different. Take on it. This gonna... is the podcast everyone needs, though, yeah. James. You, a bit like the cookbook that, there, that I thought I was going to write that nobody <laughs> yeah. wanted, but yeah, that um, one. It's 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 David Badil uh, and myself, um, and we're old friends, and we in a previous lockdown in years gone by, uh, we had an idea <laughs> that we wanted to do a podcast, and we were sort of thinking about you know. People do interviews, don't they? And they do things they're passionate about and, uh, you know, food stuff. And we came really quickly to realising that we cared most about shopping. What, <laughs> both of you? Yeah. Right, okay. So we are doing a yeah. consumer, a comedy consumer show, yeah. a <laughs> podcast called Badil and Ripley's Buy, Leave It or Not. And... Right. Um, <laughs> It is, of course. There is a pun in there. It takes a while to work out. So, um, yeah. So, we, yeah, we, we, we had we had a lot of fun, and that that's out um, beginning of February. So. 
And of course, you're doing this new thing for ITV as well at the moment. I think this is uh, season two yeah. that you're doing, which we can show a clip of now. So it's, give us the name of this show. Uh, Paulson's TV Showdown. Yeah, well, while I'm chopping up this little saucer, which is going to take about another 30 seconds, just check out this. You were on Emmerdale, Adam. I was, yeah. What I'm... an iconic TV soap. I thought you were going to say, what an iconic TV actor. <laughs> no, no you <laughs> TV actor's enough, you're... I think. <laughs> so what made you leave? I was in it for nine years. I had the best nine years of my life. But I just felt, you know, the time was right for me to move on. Um, and basically, I, I offered... Uh, well, I wanted a pay rise and they didn't give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> See you later, straight to Panther. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's coming on ITV very soon as well. In fact, everybody on that show... Yeah. I think has been on this show. Probably. Everybody's... <laughs> it's a small circuit, isn't it? It is um, a small circuit. Rob Beckett, he just makes me laugh when I just look at his face, that, that boy. Hey, um, look at Oh, these. can I say, the smell from that salsa, that... But so, this oh. is, so, this is where you sort of... The, 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 this is now ready. Um, you can just do it with the broccoli. If you just take lemon zest, put it on at the end... Yeah. Lemon is my uh, ingredient I'd take on a desert island. If I could only take one, I'd take a lemon. Really? Oh, it's just... just... This is... This this yeah. is fantastic. But you get this... Look at the lamb. And particularly this time wow. of year, I think, with the lamb. Everybody goes, lamb, you've got to wait till March, April. And definitely, definitely not. Get it right now. So good. That right smells now. amazing. UK lamb is just the best. It really, really is. But, look, you take your... Broccoli over the top. That looks so pretty. And you see, you've done this in in a pizza oven mm. in not very long at all. Takes to cook. But this is this is the salsa you see. So lemon over this. You can do this in a blender. The problem with doing it in a blender, it mushes it up too much. Yeah. So black pepper, salt, and then this is where we take a little well. Like that, in What's it. What's that? This is sherry vinegar. Sherry vinegar. Nice. This with lamb. Is incredible. So next time you're doing a, 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 you can have this for your next cookbook. Oh, it'll be next in there. Next time Don't you're worry. doing mint sauce, just 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 chop up the mint, pinch of sugar, pinch of salt, and just use sherry vinegar. Mm. Sherry vinegar is Very amazing. Nice. But you just take a good glug of sherry vinegar. What is great as well when you use a pizza oven and you just do pizza, you're at the pizza oven for the whole time because you only do one at a time. But yeah. this you can get to the table. Well, this, the whole people. point about... And um, the reason why I built this room anyway was not because I anticipated a film crew coming here, was the fact that I just love cooking for this type of food. You yeah. just cook, not for one... Well, this, this is one portion. You can double this for two if you want, but this is... Do you know what I mean? It's just the enjoyment of having food like this and seeing where it's actually cooked and where it comes yeah. from. And that interaction that you have with everybody being sat around the table. So you've got, you know, clean chopping board, and then we can take a little bit more... Olive oil over the top. Wow. And there you have my version of roasted broccoli with roasted lamb chops and a nice little herb salsa. Easy as that. Round of applause. In a, in a Faye Ripley cookbook there coming you to you very shortly. <laughs>
when the chef Gareth Ward will be firing up the stoves. I'll see you in a minute. You've got to start that way. Work your way around clockwise. Don't worry. I'm here. I'm sitting here for a while. <laughs> yeah. Welcome back. Now we've got an essential guide to what to do with your Christmas leftovers in this week's masterclass. And there's still loads more to come from my guest, Faye Ripley. He knows what's about to happen because he's just walked into the kitchen. Uh, because I'm here with a man. <laughs> if, if he doesn't get his second Michelin star this year, then I'll eat my hat because he's one of the very, very best chefs cooking in the business right now in the UK. It's brilliant. Gareth Ward! Yeah. What are you going to be doing then? So today, I'm doing, like, you know about our food. It's all about nostalgic, like, things that I love to eat. And yeah. obviously you love to eat it as well. Yeah. So I love green curry. It's one of my favourite things, you yeah. know. So this is a little dish that we have on the menu. It's right at the beginning. It's really fresh. And it's really showcasing these incredible prawns, these shrimps yeah. that we get. These are local. Hit these twice a year, once in the spring and once in the autumn. So what we're going to do is, obviously, we've got the shrimps here. We've peeled them down. That's what that's the finished ones there we're yeah. going to use a bit later. Yeah. So we've got all the shells here, the shells from the tails and the heads. Yeah. This is where all the flavour is, as you know. You, yeah. suck, you suck the insides out of these, ah, are incredible. Nice. Yeah. So first of all, we're going to start getting these roasted. We've got some beautiful light sesame oil here. So we'll put that in there. And we're going to get these cooking to get some real nice deep flavour on them. So we'll get them shells in. Don't waste any shells. Because that's where all, the, all that awesome flavour is. Yeah. So we're going to get them cooking there. Right. And then the veg that we're going to use in this. So it's beautiful lemongrass and some garlic. And yeah. we're going to turn this mincer on. Normally you would use a pestle and mortar for this. Okay. But I think mincing them on slow, you get, you get a beautiful result as well, you know? Yeah. So just start pushing them through. So yeah, just, we're going to mince all this through nice and gently. Loads yeah. of garlic. Then we've got some kaffir lime peel. Yeah. It's got beautiful flavour. A bit of ginger. And we've got some nice shallots. This Where does your love of this sort of food come from? Because it's, it's just a food I like crave. It's, I don't know why. It's just I think it's just because everything's so powerful and punchy and sweet and acidic and like floral. And because and you've it. got the local shrimp there. I mean, you use but you use the very best tuna you can find anywhere yeah. in the world. We use the like for me. There's no better shrimp in the world than these ones here. Yeah. But yeah, we're buying the best tuna. We're buying the best beef. It's all about ingredients for us. You know, it's like. We're using the best ingredients in the world, yeah. you know, really showcasing them, you know. So we just bang some green chilli through there. Obviously, you want a nice bit of heat, but you don't want it too what hot. Is, what are these you put into? This it? is um, coriander root. So right. there's obviously this is the top of the coriander. This is the bit that's under the ground. Right. It's got super amount of flavour in here. And we're also going to use the stems as well. We've got some pickled stems over here for, right. to finish the dish off later. So we've just got some lemongrass here. And, and obviously, tell everybody about your place. You, where you are, you're near, you're near the sea. Yeah. The actual hotel itself. So you know, you've changed a lot over the years. I mean, you're constantly changing a lot of everything. But yeah, it never stops. It never started off that ethos of when you started there. Though, no, was I it? mean, I was employed by a, a lovely lady called Mrs. Reen. Unfortunately, she's not with us anymore. Uh, but she just brought me in as a head chef. It was a country house hotel, very classic. I came in and I thought, you know what, I can do three years of this as head chef. Try and achieve something great and then move on, maybe find my own restaurant, get a back or something. Yeah. And I mean, things just changed. I mean, unfortunately, she died. But her business partner loved, we get on really well. We've got a great relationship together. And yeah. he asked me to stay on and then run the business. But I, I was saying to him, like, I want to change it because I don't, the hotel is not what I want to run. This place for me could be an incredible. But it was a big risk because you went from you went from what was a classical, classic country Zara's hotel. Yeah, we absolutely killed it. I mean, <laughs> talk about. I mean, change. There's change and there's change. Yeah. Nobody else has done that. It I was very scary. Right. He, uh, my business partner literally said, looked at me one day and said, "I don't think we've done the right thing here." And I said, "You've got to trust me. This will work." We absolutely slayed the beast. It didn't. It fell on it. It just fell apart. For the first year, it was scary. You know, but then, like, obviously because all them... I mean, I'm assuming the locals and your regulars that were used to coming to that sort of thing, and then you walk in there, you've got... You've got grey walls. Yeah. You've got... Well, dark green walls, painted the outside black. Yeah, the whole <laughs> outside black. <laughs> Everywhere's black. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, and it's... Schools on the walls. Schools on the walls. Music blaring out on a... On a Full-time a... DJ making, like, Vic mixing on vinyl every night. It's, yeah, it's completely turned around. Yeah. So you want to... You don't want to really cook this very long. So you're just stirring it in. 
like so. It smells amazing. And then we've got this. <coughs> so this is our dashi stock. We actually do a cold infusion dashi. Normally what you do is you'd have bottled water, bring it up to about 62 degrees, chuck your, um, your combo in, and then you'd sit, let it rest for about an hour, pass your combo out, and you'd add combo your is. Combo is like kelp seaweed. Yeah. yeah. And then you've got bonito, which is like a type of tuna. Yeah. But it's been um, brined, uh, smoked, dried, and yeah. it's like fermented. And These you get are the this. bonito flakes that you yeah. find as well. So this is an it's like a master stock. It's absolutely incredible. This yeah. is the only stock that we make in the kitchen, and it's used for everything. We call infuse ours, so when we heat it, we only ever heat it once. So when it's used, it's never been heated until that time, and then it's done. Now, you've never been to Asia? No, no, never been. One day, you're going to take me, hopefully. <laughs> never been? <laughs> never been. Can't wait to go. So where did you... Wh how, <coughs> how, what? Just a lot of research, a lot of playing around, yeah. a lot of tasting, a lot of things going wrong. We've got yeah. this new motto, though, in the kitchen, that we've got to make it wrong before you can make it right. You know, so there's a lot of failures, but then you learn from that, don't you? And you come up with this, which is yeah. what with the food that we love to eat. Yeah. So we're just going to bring that to the boil now. Yeah. It's, it smells incredible. Can you smell that? I can smell it, yeah. yeah. So then we're just going to put a nice glug of beautiful fish sauce in there. Yeah. And then coconut milk. And then that's coming up there now. And all we do is we've got some beautiful coriander, some Thai basil, and some kaffir lime leaves. Yeah. So what you do is you just throw these in, like so. Look at it. Okay. Kaffir lime leaves in there. Now I went to I went to your restaurant about six eight weeks ago, and this was probably the highlight. This is I love this dish because it's just super tasty, super fresh. But you did it with chicken when I was there. Yeah, I've done it with chicken. We've done it with there's a chalk stream trout guy. Uh, who does that beautiful, really, really special chalk seam trout. We've yeah. done it with that. We change it through the year. It depends. So obviously, like you say, we buy these shrimp. Yeah. Uh, but if we run out, obviously we run out, so we need to deviate. So we, okay. we always... So what do you do with that, then? When so after that, we yeah. blend it in here. I'm not going to blend it now, because it's going to make a bit of a mess. Yeah. So we'll just leave that in there. And the quicker you blend that up now, the better. And then you get that, and we pass it over ice. Yeah. And then you've got this here. This is this finished this, sauce? This is the finished sauce. Okay. And I don't serve my Thai green curry hot, it's just warm. Okay. For me, the flavour is much better when it's just, like, room temperature. Okay. Literally just sat on the side. OK. So... So what's next? We're going to finish this dish off. Go on, then. So we've got two of your beautiful balls here. Yeah. So what we're going to do is... Where's my shrimp? There they are, look. Yeah. So we've got a few of the ingredients that we're going to finish it off with here. We've got some uh, wasabi. Now, this is proper wasabi. This we've, is proper. We've had these, this on the show as well. These are amazing. There's a massive difference between this lot, and horseradish. A lot of the wasabi that you get in these sushi boxes or whatever you buy is fake. It's horseradish with dye in it. Yeah. There's not enough wasabi in the world to have the amount of wasabi we've got in production. Yeah. So we're just going to grind this very gently. We grind this a little bit earlier. And it's interesting, this is your classic way to grind it. This is. Yeah. This is a wooden block shark skin. Yeah, the shark skin. And they pass these down, apparently, through generations. So the smoother they get, the harder it is to grind the wasabi and the more flavour you the get in the wasabi, the, yeah. The smoother the wasabi. The smoother this gets, the smoother wasabi gets. So hopefully, like, one of my kids will be using the, this, this grater in the future. <laughs> the wasabi will be better than what yeah, I do. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> so we're just going to leave that a little bit, because wasabi is better when it's got a bit of air. Yeah. You give it a few minutes just to calm down. OK. So... I'm going to put a few of these shrimp in the bowl, as such, just like that. And then some little pickled bamboo. We don't cook our old bamboo from fresh because apparently it's poisonous and you've got to be really careful how to cook it. Right. This is what I found out, so I buy the tin stuff and well, pickle it. You tried it. that in trial and everything. I didn't try it, but I did a bit of research <laughs> yeah. on it because I was trying to buy some fresh yeah. bamboo and apparently you've got to be really careful how you cook it, so I thought, I'm not doing that. I'll get somebody else to do it and I'll just pickle it. So this is really good quality cooked bamboo, yeah. just over the top. And then this is a green pepper oil. And obviously, the, these are the flavours of a green curry. When you go to a, a Thai restaurant, it's got big chunks of green pepper in it, big chunks of bamboo, loads of fresh herbs. So this is just bringing all them flavours together, yeah. as you would have it. And then we've just got the curry sauce, which, like I said, is just at room temperature. You don't want it any higher than that. And we're just going to froth this up.
Just make it nice and light. Just spoon a bit of that over the top like so. Just put a little bit of that in there. So give us the name of this dish then. This is Rimps from um, Abu Dhabi with a Thai green curry. Gareth Ward, everybody. Right then, Chef, can I have a taste of one? I'll leave you one as well. Yeah, there so. you go, mate. Go on, then. What's not that? Oh, fresh. Oh, man alive, what an... It's all fresh, isn't it? The texture of them, flavour of them prawns, man. It's best. You, but there's, you, when you've eaten green curry, mm. you go, this is... What, what's going on? It's all right, isn't it? All oh, right, it's unbelievable. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. So when is this? When are the prawns next in season? May have sold you a um, couple of months. Yeah, March. Amazing. I'll get you some. Amazing. They're unbelievable. You lift the top of the box and they just all start jumping in your face. Ralph, <laughs> you'd like this. <laughs> you'd like this exactly. It's a taste of home. That's what it's you'd just like. so smooth, isn't it? Gareth Ward, everybody. Yeah. Chef, that is incredible. Absolutely incredible. Right, after the break, I'm off to the Isles of Scilly in another one of my food adventures. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now we've put in your Christmas leftovers to good use in this week's Little Mask Class. And I'll be laying on lunch for my guest Faye Ripley very shortly. But before that, I thought I'd take a look at some of the dishes you've been cooking at home. And first up, we've got Claire Reynolds sent us this picture of her husband, Richard, making a pizza, and he's done it properly because he's using those tin Samazano tomatoes. Brilliant job there. Next up, we've got Teresa Duckworth, who appeared on the show because she wanted to know how to make baked Alaska. Well, she went out, bought herself a mixer, not just a mixer by the looks of things, and everything else to go with it, and um, she's done it. Look at that. Job's done. And finally, top marks to Sam from Bournemouth, who treated herself to a beef rib. And she did it on a rotisserie out in the garden. I mean, that looked pretty spectacular. It's going to be taste amazing, isn't it? Now, do keep sending your pictures and videos coming in. We love what you've been inspired to cook at home. How good was that lot? OK, it's time to take a look back at one of my favourite food adventures ever. And I've finished travelling around France and America, so I'm back home in Britain, and I'm starting my journey on Islands to Highlands in the stunning Isles of Scilly. Enjoy this one. It's time to hit the road again. And this year, I'm heading to parts of the British Isles that require a little more effort to get to. I'm starting my journey by visiting a small group of islands just off the coast of Cornwall. And I'm really excited about this because apparently they're beautiful and I've never been before. They're called the Isles of Scilly and they sit around 30 miles west of the Cornish coast. This beautiful archipelago of sand fringe islands are the furthest south you can travel in the UK. And I'm beginning my adventure on the largest island, St Mary's. Right, it's time to get cooking, and I found a secluded little bay to rustle up a simple pollock dish with a bean and tomato stew. Because I'm here, and I love it here, in this amazing bay that I'm not going to tell you where it is, because I don't want you to all turn up. It'll spoil it. It's just beautiful. What I am going to have, though, is a nice glass of local wine. And I'm going to use some of this local wine to create a wonderful little dish using local caught fish, really. This over here is called pollock. So often with this, it can be quite powdery, quite mushy. What you can do is take some salt and just salt the top of it for about 
five to ten minutes before you actually cook it. So this fish has been filleted, all the pin bones are removed, but I've actually kept the skin on as well. It's a good way to keep it and hold it together. So I'm just going to leave that to one side. Meanwhile, I'm going to turn my attention whilst trying to stand on this rock without falling backwards and run through the stew for this ingredient. It's like a tomato stew, really. Really simple fennel. We've got some shallots. We've got some garlic at its base. But all I'm going to do is take the shallots and just nicely chop it. It's a really simple little dish, this, but it is fabulous. So tomatoes, a little bit of garlic. It's kind of a really basic little stew. Touch of oil to start off with. You can use a little bit of butter in there, but we're going to finish this off with a touch of butter. So the shallots and the garlic go into our little pan. And then I've got some fennel. Fennel's a wonderful, wonderful veg that's great either raw in iced water, which, to be honest, I've just felt how cool the water is behind me, so you could dip it in there if you wanted to, or you cook it for either a long time braised or in a stew like this with tomatoes. It tastes delicious. So pop your fennel in. Some little baby tomatoes. I'm using two different types of tomatoes over here. Little cherry ones. I've got these little tiger ones as well. We can chop these up and just throw these in. And then I'm going to use these ingredients over here. Now, these are amazing. These are sun blush tomatoes, and they keep them in oil. And generally, they're the smaller, sweeter tomatoes, but you can take those and pop them into our little stew as well. And you can utilise a little bit of this oil. That's why it's good to buy them in olive oil. Then, a good dollop of this local vino. And then, really, we're nearly there. I'm just going to pop in now some tin beans. These are just normal white beans. You can use haricot beans, a little bit of flagella beans. And just pop these in the mixture. And this needs to just gently stew for about five minutes. So while that's stewing, I'm going to finish this. Now, this stew, it's been cooking for about sort of, 10 minutes. It starts to wilt down the tomatoes, just to soften them up a bit. You can take it a little bit more if you want to, but as long as the tomatoes are softened up, that's fine by me. And then all round here, wherever you look, really, there's this stuff. This is rock samphire. It's the sea spray that brings this stuff to life. It's absolutely delicious. And together with this, these are called sea beets. This, when it's available, and it is literally available, because it's just there, it's perfect for this, so I'm going to grab a bit of that and pop it straight in. Together with the old sea beets. Now, also what works with this is a nice little bit of butter. That much. Good knob of butter to this. Some salt. A little bit of salt. And give this a mix. And you see as the butter melts, it thickens up this stew. But also, treat it like spinach. Don't overcook it. So as soon as you mixed it in, off the heat. And we'll leave that off there. Now, I'm going to pop my pan on here, cos now it's all about the fish. But first, I've got to wash it off. Times like this where you think, I'm too old for this. You know what I mean? Could be a sea lion coming out in a minute. Ugh. I've washed my hands, grab a little bit more butter. Then all we're going to do is just simply cook the fish. It's going to take about two minutes. Now, the fish is about probably 30 seconds away, something like that, and you can tell what happens when you salt it. The texture almost changes. It's quite a big difference, particularly if you're going to deep fry this in batter. It's a good way to salt it first as well. But just to simply serve this, we've got our stew. You can see by adding that butter what happens to this stew. You get it lovely. Look at that. 
stew. It's like the best baked beans. Look at that. And then we've got our plate, which just happens to be down here. And you can pile this all over it. This is a dish for sharing, so you just pop it in the middle of the plate and let everybody dive in. But then just grab your fish. Pop this over the top. Like that. And then just to finish this off, I'm just gonna put a little drizzle of olive oil over the top. And there we have it. A dish from there, well, there as well, with some local wine. It's my kind of food, that. Time to see if my lovely pollock and stew packed with flavour is the local's kind of dish. Yummy. Mm. Mm, that's good. Mm. Really nice. It really is delicious, isn't it? Yeah, it's gorgeous. What do you think, Ellen? Yummy. Mum, you've got to try and cook this now. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure there, then. What was amazing about that trip is that I've never been to the Isle of before, and it was like the Caribbean. The water is just beautiful. So put that on your holiday list for this year coming. Uh, still to come, Chef Richard Corrigan will be in the kitchen very shortly, and I've got a show-stopping dish for, in store for Faye Ripley a little bit later. But after the break, I'm back in the kitchen with a masterclass in Christmas leftovers. We've got ham, we've got cheese, we've got a bit of turkey. It's a proper sandwich, this one. I'll see you in a minute. Welcome back. Now I'll be cooking one final course. My guests, Faye Ripley and Chef Richard Corrigan, will be serving up another brilliant fish dish a little bit later. But first, it's time for this week's masterclass. And this week's masterclass is uh, putting all your Christmas leftovers to good use. Uh, but I've got some beautiful ham over here. It's a croque monsieur. So croque monsieur technically is a little bechamel sauce, but it's slightly thicker than usual. Uh, a cheesy bechamel sauce with a little bit more stability to it, because you want it to hold together. So the first thing, what you want to do with a classic bechamel sauce is start off with milk. So, milk, and you infuse the milk with an onion clouté. Now, I've done this on the show before, but it, it's just so important to keep recapping it that it's just not milk, flour and butter. It's an onion clouté, and this is where you get the base of the flavour from. So that is an onion clouté. A bay leaf, studded together with cloves, one or two, and an onion. And we pop that in here. And what you want to do is we want to warm this up. Um, and we gradually sort of infuse all that flavour. So think of it like a custard. Uh, and rather than this being vanilla, of course, we're infusing the onion, the bay leaf, and the clove in there. So just bring it to the boil and then switch it off and we just can happily sit there. While that's happening, we'll turn our attention to our cheese. I've got some Gruyere cheese over here. So we want a decent couple of slices of this. That is not the slice that's going in the sandwich before you phone in and complain. But then we're just gonna start, mind you, start, start the year as we go on then, won't it really? But look, we're just gonna take our nice bits of cheese and we're gonna slice a few bits of that. They're the bit slices that are gonna go in there. But I'm gonna take this. now. Interesting enough, Gruyere can be aged as well. A lot of people just go around the supermarket and think, oh, well, I'll just get this one off the shelf. You can actually get it where it's aged like Parmesan as well, and you get that distinct colour to it and flavour. So we're going to grate this up while we're warming up our milk. You can see in there the pan is just starting to come to a boil now. So we're not far off. So we'll take our cheese. Now, the good thing about this, it becomes stringy. So you can use Gruyere. Uh, Emmental's a good one. Another great one to use a one is, is a French one called Comte, which is sort of like our version of a cheddar. I mean, cheddar's great as well, of course, but the Comte is a really, really good one to use also. So I'm going to take that. Now you see this milk has then sort of warmed up, which is fine. Then pop this pan on the stove. This is where we then turn it into our sauce. Now this is almost sort of, not trial and error, but it's understanding how to make a white sauce first. And whenever you do that, it's usually people say it's equal quantities butter and flour for a white sauce. I think by doing that, it becomes too thick. But particularly when we go back to doing this, 
crop my sure star stuff, that's where the rule applies. You want a little bit more flour than normal. So we just want to melt the butter. It's important not to brown the butter at this stage. So we just want the butter to melt because we don't want any colour to this to keep it nice and white. So we've got that melting away nicely, which is good. Now with a plain flour, a good two tablespoons and a bit, I think, for this. And we can start to whisk this up. Now, if you're looking at this, this roux would be slightly thicker than this if I was doing a normal standard white sauce. So as soon as we get to that stage, we can then pour in the milk. Now, a lot of people say the milk needs to be cold. It's not necessary at all. You just need to add the milk in about two or three stages. And just use a whisk. Now, it'll start to get a bit lumpy at one point, and then by using a whisk and keeping it on the stove and keeping it on the heat, it'll come together. Look at that. It's just come together nicely. So be confident with it. Add the milk in sort of three stages, and it'll all start to thicken up. And you can see now, you can get the texture of how you want it. So that's not looking too bad. Now, at this point in time, we can then pop in our cheese. Just a little bit. Dump that in. Turn the heat down a little bit. And just melt this. Now this is where it's important. You've got a little bit of leftover milk. So I was saying you can alter this stability of it now. So it's not too thick or it's not too thin. But this is rather than it just being a standard white sauce, this is where you get this lovely stringiness <coughs> with the croque monsieur. So many times in France I've had it where it's just a piece of cheese, white sauce, and a bit of ham. You can see that, that's all just melted very, very quickly into there. We can turn that off now and then season it. Some salt and pepper. You've only got a little bit of milk left over. You see, that's where you get that classic sort of nice thick sauce. So we can leave that to one side. That's that bit done. Next, we'll bring our pan across. And then we can take our bread. It's entirely up to you how thick you want it. But this is a decent sort of size. There we go. And then what we can do, and then start to layer this all up. Now, I've got some ham over here. You can use leftover bits of Turkey, it's entirely up to you, but we're going to take our ham. This is a double whammy, this one, so I'm just going to take this and then do this two layers. Amongst that. Take a little bit of the red currant jelly on one. Go. Bit of the old cheese. Are people watching this thinking he's making two? No, he's making one. He's making one. This, we're going to take that. And then you've got your cheese. So this is where you get that almost like a cheese fondue with this. Once you've got that bit, you take that bit, put it on that bit, and then more. And you want it all to gooey and leak out everywhere. And that looks good as it is. It's not even, not even close to being as good as if you get a pan and take a good knob of butter. Because you've got to start this year as you ended last year. 
on a diet. Look. Now, don't go ruin this by pan frying it in margarine. And then what we do is with this, you take the butter. And then we just pan fry it. Like that. So it's equivalent to toasting it, but clearly I can't get this in my toaster. And then what we want to do is pan fry this. Pan fry it one side, nice bit of colour, turn it over, pan fry it the other side. So then we can do, get a nice bit of colour on it. Pretty good. Now on the other side. <laughs> and then what you want to do with this, is get your foaming butter over the top. It wouldn't be great if all New Year's start like this. Look. Mind you, if you lived on this, you wouldn't have many New Year's left, to be honest with you. But... So there you have it. Start the New Year with my croque monsieur. Done. Whenever I do this dish at home, look who's here. No, you're not having it. Look at the nose going. There we have it. Now, if there's something you'd like to learn about in a little mask then do get in touch. We'll see if we can help out right here on the show. Time now for a quick break now, but join again in a couple of minutes when living legend Richard Corrigan will be in the kitchen. Keep your eyes off it. Keep your eyes off it. You prefer that, wouldn't you? Welcome back. Now, shortly I'll be cooking my final dish for Faye Ripley. Uh, but uh, joining me in the kitchen is a chef who's been setting the restaurant scene alight for over 30 years in London. It's the magical man himself. Mr Richard Corrigan! Yeah. Thank you, you know the food is good when this little fella comes in and he's sat here waiting. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sat here waiting as well. Uh, welcome to the house. Happy New Year and all that. Thank you. It is, it is we need to celebrate, don't we? We do. Because it's not been easy, has it, for the last couple of years? No, it has. Uh, you could say there's been lots thrown at us, you yes. know what I mean? The wind, the wind has been very strong, yeah, you know? exactly. But anyway, you're going to be cooking fish, which yeah. is... Uh, tell us about this dish, because I know you want to get it in the oven well, first. Well, listen, I need to get this into the oven first. It's, yeah. a, it's a sole stuffed with a little stuffing of kale, yeah. a little bit of shallot, yeah. and uh, it's, instead of using wine on this, yeah. I'd just like to use plenty water. This is mineral water you use? Yeah, it? just mineral water. Okay. And of course, Lincolnshire poacher butter. Now, you know, it is New Year's. <laughs> the dietitians are not around anywhere. <laughs> and we'll put a little bit in there, and yeah. that goes into the oven for yeah. exactly around four and a half minutes with a bit of resting. Okay, all right. So and that's then we're going to show you how to make it. Then, then we are. So it's okay. A Dover sole is very expensive. Yep. Worked out at probably 16 pound, 48 to, uh, or sorry, 18 to 22 ounce. Yeah. And two fillets is plenty for a portion, I personally yeah. think. Okay. And I've just, just a little bit of knife just down the back of them, yeah. stopped them from curling up, and just bat it down, but not too much. You don't want to, you want to taste that. Now, this has been on, uh, this has been on the, your restaurant menu quite a long time ago, hasn't it? This really? was on in, uh, from the first got my first mission star. Lindsay House, uh, all those years ago, 1995. Yeah. Wow. Uh, this was on my menu. Yeah. I cooked it for a year and I never cooked it again. It was so popular, I sold so much of it. You got I just, bored I of just it. I had to just get rid of it, <laughs> you know what I mean, really. And yeah. we've smoked a little bit of Molden salt. I know Molden smoked their own salt, but we smoke Molden itself right. because we just get a nicer smoke out of it. Yeah, that's a, that's a whole different ball that's game a to whole different smoke. Because so, often a lot of the smoke salt you get is it's not chemical. I'm sure it's not chemical. No, it's not. But from this tastes Morden. like kippers. Absolutely, and I love. I, I personally love it like that. Right. So basically, the kale. That's amazing. The kale itself. Let's not try too hard. You right. know. We just put our stuffing on there. 
Very simple. Now, this is very I, nice. I've always wanted to ask you this. You, you were quite, when you were brought up in Ireland, of course, quite yeah. a rural, up, rural upbringing. Yeah, absolutely. A, fa fa a fair cry from where you are now. <clears throat> what does your family think of that? Because they go, well, let's be clear. You're brought up where there's a peat bog a half a mile from your house, <laughs> right? Let's, let's be clear. Yeah. And now I'm not too far from Bond Street. Yeah. <laughs> now, where would you like to live? By the peat bog. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you something. Person. You're asking the wrong person. Once you, you show a person from the country no, Bond true. Street, your no. life changes, yeah? <laughs> well, your, your, your credit card changes. Your credit card right. changes as well. Listen, we're in central London over 30 years now. It's been what, what brought you to London anyway? Where did, where did you work? Where... I was living in Amsterdam. I left Ireland at 17. I was right. living in Amsterdam. Yeah. And my wife, who was a nurse in then HS, yeah. came over, and so was my sister, Maura. Yeah. They came over to visit me on a holiday. Yeah. And I spotted this gorgeous chick, right. who was still my wife, by right. the way. And I went, she's the one. Yeah. And I followed her back to London. She was a student nurse. We've been together since. I've it. been jobbing around. I kept in the students' nurses' home in Holloway Road, James, where the rent was cheap. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, NHS. Thank you, NHS. So where were, you, where were you working in London that particular time? I was working in the Meridian Oak Room for a guy called Michel Laurent from yeah. the Côte Saint Jackson Chouinet. Yeah. And he just arrived in London, and I kind of knew them from Amsterdam because yeah. they'd done a few dinners. Because your food, stuff. your food is still classical, classical, isn't it? You do, I mean, you've got modern twists in there, but your food is classic, classics. I, I just think, you know, great company. Yeah. A few courses. It's had four minutes, that, by the way. It's doing very well. Yeah, OK. And so what do you, you the fish yourself, you put the kale. The, put the kale into it. Yeah. A bit of shallot on the top of it. Yeah. Tiny little, tiny little bit of butter. Yeah. And that's for the customer to say, because mine got a lot more butter like that. Right. And a little bit of moisture. I don't okay. use wine when I'm cooking the fish like this because I find it creates a little bit of acidity that I don't need. Okay. And what I do now... So where did the love of fish and seafood comes in? Because that's, you know, you, you, do, you do cook a lot of it. Where, where does the love of that come from? My father was a very good fisherman. Mm -hmm. We had a boat. I used to go out on most weekends. He was a very good fly fisherman. And there was always a bag of fish coming in, a few pheasants and a few wild rabbits and yeah. a bit of hair. Now, I'm not talking the ideal story, but you know what I mean? Yeah. There was a wild salmon in there as well. Yeah. Oh, there was... <laughs> slightly, slightly... I'm not saying a word. Slightly poached, yes. as you might say, in those days, yeah? Now, tell me about this cheese, cos cheese and fish, you hardly ever see it, but this is, this is pretty special. Beaufort cheese just comes into season in November, December. I think it's the king of the, the Alpine cheeses. It's from the Savoie. Mm -hmm. Things of Tom Gris, Tom de Savoie, your Emmentals, your... Your, your other hard cheeses, which we all know goes really well. Can I try a bit of that? Oh, please. This is, this is, it is, if you've never tried I mean, one before, it is. That's, it's really good. I mean, the, the French have this thing, Comte, which is really nice, but this is a yeah. different, this has got so much now, depth to it, isn't it, really? It's beautiful. That goes in there, James, yeah? Just and to only melt. for a couple of minutes, that Just now. for a couple of minutes, yeah. Well, it's interesting, four Not minutes right. that cooks that fish. So what are, what are we cooking four in minutes. the pan over here? Uh, we're going to cook now, we're going to cook the little bit of shh. Sep. Yeah. Right. And most importantly, I think, for the seps is, please don't fry them. Yeah. You don't need to fry them. You just need to warm them through. Right. You just need to warm them through very nicely and be generous. So I mentioned, I mentioned Bentleys. We've, we've got Corrigans in Mayfair. Yeah. You, t tell everybody about this place you've got in Ireland, because it's... I think I grow veg. And then I sort of follow you on Instagram and think, yeah, that's just depressing now. How many gardens have you got over there? I have uh, seven acres of gardens. I have yeah. my own heritage fruit orchard. Uh, things like uh, Glenstall, Cookers, Carbon Gold, yeah. uh, Gooseberries, Red Currants, uh, everything. And one thing I don't do, I don't cover anything. Right. I, don't, I don't make them bird. So nothing in, nothing in polytunnels, no, none of do. that? I do. I kale in polytunnels at the moment. Yeah. Uh, it's done very well. My carrots, my celery eggs. Uh, it's, you know, we've, we've, we've lost. We have so much. Yeah. I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud, proud of the gardening team because, let's be very clear, only when you grow it do you realise how expensive it is. Uh, another thing, only until you grow it you realise how much respect for you are that produce food for you. And it tastes fresh. That's nothing better. You want fresh fish, so why shouldn't you have fresh veg, 24 yeah, hours old? Do, yeah. And this is... Now, most chefs would just say, 
give them a nice color. I say don't bother. Give them a little moisture. Yeah. Just give them a little moisture, soften them up. This is what I love your cooking. It's you know, just, when you come here, it's just cooking. You know what I mean? You still love food as much as you did. I'm way back a greedy, then. gluttonous individual. I'm <laughs> unbelievably bad. One thing I, you never want to do is go out, go out for a night out with uh, Mr. Corrigan. Um, I know it tends not to finish. No, you know what I mean? It, 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 historically, it's a, night out or a weekend, really, is it? Really? Uh, but, yeah. I mean, we did auction it with Mark Hicks a night out with the two of us once. Yeah. Someone for the for the Hammersmith Children's Hospital that paid twenty five thousand pounds to go out with us, right. and they cancelled at the last moment when they realised <laughs> what they were up against. <laughs> And that is a that Mark Hicks, and you could imagine. <laughs> and Jeremy in the Wolseley kindly offered a hangover breakfast thrown in on the occasion. <laughs> and the hedge fund that bought it, they just ran away when they heard these guys are <laughs> deadly. This, this is rich and tasty and gorgeous. Yeah. And it needs, because it's kale, it doesn't need lemon. Right. It needs a little touch of the vinegar from the caper. <laughs> just, 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 just not, not much more than that. Yeah. And then, but this is a lesson. To, this is lesson to any chefs watching this. And you're on about Michelin star and fine dining. This is, this is how you get it because it's it's got to be about cooking. I think it's about combination of getting to know them flavours, getting them onto a place, confidence, it's as quick as time possible. Yeah. Without flapping around. We all know what flapping around is. Yeah. And anything that's in there, this is this is heaven now. This is. This is the holy sacraments. The, the juices on that is, <laughs> is it, yeah? They go in there. So what's, tw what's 22, 2022 going to bring Mr Corrigan, then? What's going to bring you? Well, I think, it's a, I think it's time to... We have our nice little place in London. We've yeah. fought our landlords. They've all been great. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. Uh, I think my son is now running the business, really. You could say they're Richard. They're kind of the front of house. Yeah. And Jessica does the PR yeah. and the marketing a little bit. And between the whole lot of them, you know something? You've not got a bad team, have you, really? I, you know what? We're a family business. Yeah. And I'm proud to say that, you know, like I showed you earlier. I love this team. Like, look at this. <laughs> That's the Corrigan household. <laughs> Nothing goes in the bin. Yeah. Nothing in the bin. And then we just take a little, it is New Year. Yeah. And Whoopsie daisy. It is a season of celebration. So give us the name There's, of this dish. It looks it's, spectacular. It's Dover Soul, stuffed with kale, seps, buffer cheese, and truffle. By one of the best chefs in the business. Richard Corrigan, everybody. Right, I'm looking forward to this. Because people will be sat there going, fish and cheese, fish and cheese. Works there, doesn't it? It's perfectly cooked cheese. Oh, I'm very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I love our food, you know, you know I do. But that cheese is... Buffered, it's It's very special, isn't it? Well, do you know what's interesting as well? It comes from a breed of cattle in the Pyrenees that's related to the aurochs. The yeah. European wild cattle as well, and I don't want to I don't want to romanticise about things that doesn't have a link. But there's a there's a depth of flavour in Beaufort that you just don't get. I get the similar fever from the king of cheeses, is the blue cheese. You know, yeah. the Basset Stilton to me is the king of all cheeses, an English cheese, the king of all cheeses. Basset Stilton sits at the very top. But when you taste the Beaufort, I have the similar relationship with the cheese. Yeah. Basset Stilton and Port does it for me. And I'm, 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 I am anyone's after a bit of Basset Stilton and Port. <laughs> Do you know what? It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. So please come back again the rest well, of the year James, as well. Thank you. Cheers. Happy Richard New Corrigan, year. everybody. Yeah. The legend. This needs to go back on your restaurant menu as well. This is special. Very, very special. Uh, so join me after the break when I'll be cooking one more final dish for Frey Ripley. I'll see you then. Just giving you time to finish off this. Go on then, Ralph. Go on, you can have one bit. Here you go. Cool. Welcome back, sadly, to the last part of the show, but I'm back in the kitchen with my brilliant guest. It's the one and only Faye Ripley. Yay! Thanks for having 
Yeah. So the, the lamb chops are a distant memory. They've gone. Um, we've gotten here some lovely little Dover sole. Um, I think this is the best fish uh, you'll get anywhere. Uh, this is amazing. Mm. Majority comes from Hastings. Um, beautiful Dover soap. We're going to cook that with a lovely little sauce out of mussels, a little bit of curry powder, a little bit of coconut milk, some tomatoes, some ginger, some garlic, and all that kind of stuff. So first thing I'm going to do is get, get the mussels on the go, because I want the juice of the mussels as well. So we're going to get those in the pan with some ginger and shallot and that kind of stuff. We can take the ginger. There we go. Now, we mentioned your love of food, and particularly writing cookbooks and bits and pieces, mm. but... Taking over a food critic's job, how on earth did that happen? Uh, this was because I, I Jay Rayner yeah. asked me to J step in. The one and only is Jay Rayner, yeah. Who is obviously a god, yeah. uh, a food god, yes. And he asked me to review, do a, to take over uh, one of his uh, columns for a week. Um, I mean, what a gig! <laughs> what a gig! <laughs> Basically, asking me to do my favourite thing in the world, which is yeah. go out for food to a, my favourite place. Um, Could you pick your favourite place, or is it something uh, that he picked? He did not pick it. Right. Um, I. I mean, look, I went all around the houses, and I. I really thought about it, and I ended up at the end of my road. Um, not Good just enough, nothing out of that. laziness, but because I really, really love it. It's a place called The Bull and Last, and it's a gastro pub, but it's more than that. It's, you know, it's got love and uh, amazing food at the heart of it, and they've got rooms, and um, I loved it. Basically, it was the best job ever. Uh, I did very say brief. to him, he has got an amazing job. He, apparently, he only picked me because he thought I wasn't after his job. Well, it's true, because apparently everybody wants to be... Yeah. Well, he's wrong. I totally want his job. <laughs> like, he totally got that wrong. I'm like, no, I would kick you to the curb, Jay. Well, talking about jobs, we, the, the, the mussels have gone in here as well. That's all that's got the white wine in there. Uh, the fish I'm basically going to prepare now, so mm. that's how you're lovely Dover sole. You can tell a Dover sole because it looks like a ruby ball as opposed to normal sole, which is more like a... Well, it's a dip, less streamlined over here. We've got beautiful... It looks like a slipper. Yeah, well, some people call them slip soles, and they're not slip soles. Ah. Uh, you get these things called megrim soles and slip soles, mm. which almost look like translucent uh, soles. So they look about the size of this, sometimes a little bit smaller, um, but they almost the skin looks very, very translucent. Um, megrim sole, they would be called as as well, but there are lots of different ones, obviously, from lemon sole and everything. To remove the skin, because I don't like the skins on Dover sole, you, you want to sort of wiggle the skin like this, and the skin comes off in one go. But look, you've got this beautiful sole over here. We can cut this up into nice fillets. Mm. And all I'm going to do is simply pan fry that. Now, I mentioned about different jobs. Whether this is right or not... What I mean, have you found? Don't I, say I it. Found, I found that you, you, before you were acting, you were doing all manner of different sort of jobs. Well, that's Timeshares, is that correct? Selling timeshares? Yeah, I was... So that bit's right. Flogging yeah. timeshare on Kensington High Street. <laughs> right. And the only way... I'd get a tenner for every couple that I got into the office, but no one would go in because you say, "Will you go up to the office <laughs> and we're going to flog you some timeshare?" That didn't work, so I said I was making an advert. Unfortunately, a couple of people got quite aggressive. Didn't they come back and find you? They did come running down the <laughs> high street <laughs> to maybe beat me up. Um, but yeah, that, anyway. so that was that was correct. That was correct. So yeah. what about what about the fact that you were running a a tan tanin salon? Yeah, I did. I mean, I'm. I still have dreams about wiping the sweat off the uh, off the sunbeds and so, folding the towels. So the other bit on was letters after your name. Did that come from that bit, or what, where was that bit from? Um, why do you why do you have letters after your name? A S T O. Faye Ripley A S T O. Association of Suntan Operators. I'm proud of it, and I've got letterhead. Is that what it is? <laughs> Yeah, right, I okay. think I'm not putting that on my letters right. to the council. <laughs> sure I am. Um, I haven't got any other letters, so I'm kind of just stuck with them. Um, but yes, I mean, you live a life as an actress. Early days, you have to live the life, and hopefully, you bring that to the. Party. And this is where I was. I was searching a little bit deeper with this, and I thought this this is either right or it's definitely, 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 definitely fake. George Michael was the famous client. He was. He was, and I pretended to not recognise him every time, even though I was dying inside. And every time I'd go, are oh, you a member? And I knew full well he was a member. Right. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he, he had... He used the sunbeds. I mean, I think that was obvious. Um, that was... Yeah. And yeah. I would sell the towels that he used. 
That wasn't part of that wasn't part of the Google search. That, that one. I did. I'm, I'm, I'll be honest with you. I right. wiped the sweat off and then framed the towels and sold them. I mean, you okay. know, what am I not going to do that? Well, I'm just just saying that it's just a, a additional pocket money. It's adaption. Uh, I'm at, at the very heart. I'm an entrepreneur. Exactly. Um, so. Anyway, I'm sure you would have been fine with it. <laughs> um, but yes, those, I'm going to say those were the dark years. Well, I don't know about that, but look, we're going to take our nice little, we're going to make a little sauce with this, all right? So, so hang on, you've taken the mussels out. So the mussels come out, I've taken the juice from that. Mm. So in, in here we've got the juice of the, the, the garlic, the ginger, so you've got a little bit of white wine to cook the mussels. I've got some curry powder, just well, to touch I it. I wouldn't have put in. I mean that. Curry and mussels, amazing combination. Well, let's see, let's see. Unbelievable combination. And then you take the liquor mm. from the mussels. And then this is where you need to reduce this down now to get this amazing little sauce. So at the same time as reducing it down, we can then take our coconut milk as well. What we want to do is add this mm. to our pan. And you don't use coconut cream? You, you can do, but I, I prefer coconut milk with this. And what we want to do is just bring this to the boil and rapidly sort of cook this down now. So we're going think, to reduce this down. I think people are scared. I say people, I mean me. What's that? <laughs> of, uh, of mussels, of shellfish. Well, shellfish Just in general, it right. you were telling me a story as well, again, back to your husband, mm. that uh, it didn't go down too well, did it, already on holiday? It, well, yeah, it wasn't mussels, it was uh, vongole, so it was clams, and it was on, uh, on holiday. And it's always on holiday in a hot on climate. on holiday, in a, not a great restaurant, let's be honest. Uh, and basically, it nearly killed him. But um, anyway, I'm, we're all here. <laughs> to sort of tell well, this, the tale. this. So what? You, look, we're just going to finish this off because mm. I know you love your cooking. Hence, you've got your fourth fourth book in the pipeline. But you won't tell me what it's all about. It's the called my. One. I've nicked it from James. That's probably Pepper. what it's going to be about. Yeah, <laughs> it's fine. I've got two great recipes. <laughs> Fabulous. So this one. So we've got our mussels there cooking away. This one, what we're going here <laughs> is to finish up cooking our fish. Now the thing is with with soil, you want to cook this quite quickly, particularly pan frying it. Mm. So get the butter nice and golden brown, as it's starting to go golden brown. In we go with the fish, like that. And you, like I say, keep the pan, keep the pan nice and hot, keep it moving. Sometimes you've got to just pop this in a little bit of flour, but you want to get this nice and hot. And this is where you need to concentrate now. So you get this nice and hot, and you want to get a nice bit of colour on it. Like that, because when you turn it over, you've got about 30 seconds to finish it. Have you? So, I'm stressed. I can't get this bit wrong. Well, I no, this is, a, this is the key to it, I think. You've just got to be quite, quite confident, but yes. quite quick with it. OK. Keep it moving around in a pan. Like I said, that little bit of flour will help it. But keep that moving around. You can see it cooking halfway up the side. And then what you want to do is flip this over. Good. Happy? I'm happy with that. So you've got that nice bit of colour on it. Mm. Now, sometimes with plates and bits and pieces like that, you don't want as hot as pan as that. You want it sort of a coolish pan and then bring it up. Problem if it's too hot, the fish sort of curls up. Oh, right. Because one thing you don't want to be doing is, is allowing this to go tough, or certainly not overcooking it. So while that's happening... Yeah. Does it curl less if you haven't got the skin on? Um, Do you know what I mean? Will, the skin will toughen it up, so you've got to take the skin yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. So often with Dover sole, there's a classic dish called Dover sole Meunier, which is nut brown butter which is the classic, classic one, which would all be roasted on the bone, really, and only taken to the table and taken off the bone. But the bone keeps the moisture into the fish. Oh. So that's what you want to do, is you don't want to take the moisture out of it by overcooking it. So yeah. as soon as it's ready like this, we take it off. In we go with the lime, a little bit of lemon. Lovely. I'll flip this over. So this is not cooked yet. Is so it, is it going to keep going? No, it's not cooked, because the heat of the pan, or the heat of the fish sat in here, will continue to cook this. So the most important bit is don't overcook it in the pan, like that. <gasps> but that, that's just beautiful. Serve it on that with a little knob of butter, that'll be ace. Yeah. But then what we're going to do is come back to our sauce. And this is where we can search a few of these mussels that are in here. A few of these. They can go back in, like that, for a bit of colour. And then we can warm this all up. And then what we do with this, we grab a bit of that. We can take our mussels, place those over top. This is very restauranty. Well, it's not really, Faye. I mean, it's... to look at. 
you know, you I've know. just done this. I've just done this in what less than seven minutes, eight True. minutes. True, but it's so impressive. Do you know what I mean? Well, I'm going to pay the big money for this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being honest with you. I mean, upwards of seven pounds fifty. Well, seven pound fifty for this. <laughs> For Dover Soul, whoa, I'll definitely be skin. <laughs> no, it's very, but, very Look, you take pretty. some fresh coriander. There's tonnes of food in there with mm. it, but this is what I, I would eat. Just a nice little bit. And then we're going to finish this off with a little bit of green oil. So we take the leftover bits of, um, take the leftover bits of herbs and just blend them so you don't waste any. But this is a bit of coriander oil. And when you blend it, you put it in the fridge and the water separates out from the chlorophyll, the top and it's the oil on the top separates out from the water, you end up with this oil. It makes this herb, which normally would go off in a so week... you take the dark bit? Yeah, this would then go in the fridge for mm. three, four months. I'm going to do that. There you go. Let's so there you have that. it. My uh, wow. pan-fried dover sole with mussels and tomatoes. Done. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> There we have it, page 72 of your new cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Tell me what you think of that one. Well, that... Just taste it with the fish, but the fish, that... the mussels and everything. The sauce, I'll tell you. You, the, you won't believe how much flavour you get from that. But the key to this is the ginger. Keep the skins on the ginger as well. You get this wonderful warmth from it. That's unbelievable. Honestly, I might even come to one of your restaurants now. <laughs> you very much. So good. That is crazy, crazy Well, I'll good. send you directions, because you thought, literally, when she arrived this morning, said, I love this place, it's near Wales. Yeah, it's nowhere near Wales, is Nowhere it? near no, Wales, yeah, no. nowhere near Wales. Mm. Tell me what you think. Happy? I mean, just leave me. Come back That's later. Right. Well, I'll, it's a pleasure to have you at the house. Mm. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Good luck with 2022. This is a good start. It's not a bad start, is it? Mm. It's a pleasure to have you at the house. There we go. That's all we've got time for today. A massive thank you to all my guests, Amelia Lake, Gareth Ward, Richard Corrigan, and of course, the fabulous Faye Ripley. Yeah. Mm. People are going to be Googling towels. That's what they're going to be doing. <laughs> uh, we'll see you back here at the same time next Saturday morning. We'll be joined by Chef Lizzie Waters, uh, Andreas Alame, uh, tennis star Johanna Conta will be here. Until then, take care, stay safe. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye for now. Mm.